Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very last session of the Reeve Summit 2021, where care, cure, and community connect. I'm Representative Jennifer Longdon, sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am thrilled to have with me today Felicia Gibson, Wesley Hamilton, and Tyra Randell. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? I'm doing uh, great. Awesome. So today we we're going to wrap up the summit with um, with an important discussion on Black lives living with paralysis. We're going to be uh, talking all of us as survivors of gun violence, and we're going to talk about gun violence, health equity, and the issues impacting marginalized communities living at the intersection of disability and and. Um, and marginalization. So let's get started. As I said, I'm Representative Jennifer Longdon. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I was paralyzed 17 years ago as a result of gun violence. And I first came into contact with the Reef Foundation when I sent off for my first paralysis resource guide. And we're going to be talking throughout this session about uh, some of the resources that the Reef Foundation offers. But we're going to get started here. Uh, rather than listen to me, I want you to hear these fabulous people. Let's start with you, Tyra. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be with us here today? Hi, yes. Well, my name is Tyra Randall, as she just said. Um, I live in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm 29 years old, and I've been a paraplegic now for a year and a couple of months. Um, last January 15th, um, I was shot eight times by my lovely ex, I will always say. Um, basically, the story was, if I can't have you, no one else will. He basically stalked me for a couple of days. I made police reports, did everything I was supposed to do. And then um, one day my daughter was leaving out the door for school and when we opened up the door, he was right there. Um, so yeah, that was my story and the road to recovery has been very, I would say fulfilling and rewarding at the same time because um, you don't know who you are until you've been tested with something like this. Um, as well as I have a, a 12 year old and a one-year-old now who were both there when this happened. Um, by the grace of God, I was able to take care of my children um, during the midst of my recovery. They got to stay at the hospital with me as well as the um, rehab facility with me. Um, and so it's been a mental battle, especially for my oldest daughter because my kids were there when this happened. But I'm just happy to be here and blessed to be alive um, as well as I'm thankful for my people that I have in my corner to help me um, on my road to recovery to make this transition a little bit easier. Thanks, Tyra. And what really um, struck me immediately in your story is uh, one of your first acts of, of self-advocacy was holding your family together through rehab. Uh, so congratulations on that. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, women in domestic violence situations are five times as likely to be shot. Um, so when domestic violence and a gun are present together, the results are disastrous as we know. Uh, Wesley, you also live with the impact of having been shot. Um, and um, tell us a little bit about your story before we go on and talk to Felicia. All right, what's up everybody? This is Wesley Hamilton. Uh, I'm a Kansas City native. I actually, I'm great friends with Ty. We knew each other both before our injury. Um, January, 2012, I was shot multiple times in my abdomen after an altercation, which led to me being paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of my life. I am a T11, T12 paraplegic. Um, within my journey, it's been nine years, so I have a nonprofit organization called Disabled But Not Really, where I just really just help other people like myself create their identity. Um, as a Black disabled man, I've dealt with a lot of adversity, just being able to try to maneuver and live the life that I live today. And um, yeah, just really just pushing positivity, but also making people more aware that it is 
difficult for us that do that are uh, victims or survivors of gun violence and um, especially if you're a person of color. So having this conversation is great because of course, I didn't get a lot of resources provided to me at the time of my injury. And I think that's what we're really talking about today is what resources are out there for people of color, people that are facing gun violence as well. And then, you know, especially when the resources have been provided to us all along. So um, I'm happy to be a part of this conversation. I would like to go more in depth once we start to really pick up, but thank you for having me and I'm ready. <laughs> We're gonna dig in here in just a second, my friend Wesley. For those of you that are looking at him and thinks he looks a little familiar, Wesley is one of the heroes that's been profiled on Queer Eye for the straight guy. Uh, notice how impeccably your skin looks. Your skin is amazing. I hope you're still following your skincare routine. But, um, and you also talked about your nonprofit organization. We're gonna talk about how the Reed Foundation can help nonprofit organizations when we dig in. Now, Felicia, you, uh, your story again, every story around paralysis is unique and yours is as well. You were typically able at this point in time. So will you tell us how you came to join us here today? Yes, yeah, so I'm Felicia Gibson. I live in Savannah, Georgia and August, of 2018 my boyfriend was letting our dog out in our front yard and there were people breaking into cars in our neighborhood and he wanted to go and be as i call him captain america and check the license plate for the car that drove off so when he did that they shot out of the window and uh shot him directly in the center of his neck uh the bullet shattered on his t1 and it resulted in him being a uh, level C67 quadriplegic. That basically changed everything. I'm not paralyzed myself, but I never had to look at life a little bit differently. So immediately went to the emergency room, spent two weeks here in Savannah, got transferred up to Atlanta for about two months, then transferred to uh, Augusta for two months with the VA. And uh, luckily he made full recovery as far as his general health. There's still some side effects, just um, spinal cord injuries that we still deal with. Um, but our journey has definitely opened our eyes. Um, it made me want to get involved with advocacy more. Um, I started volunteering with the Reef Foundation as a regional champion. Um, started to do stuff with the um, Process Resource Center. And uh, basically, we're just trying to get back to normal as much as we can. Um, my story is also a little bit different because I, I'm African-American, my husband is a white male. Um, and we actually, we did get married after all that in ICU. <laughs> but we are just looking forward to getting our lives back together with the, where they should be right now as, um, not so newlyweds anymore and helping other people as much as we can. And thanks for being with us, Felicia. Uh, you know, the REAV mission is care, cure, and community. And that became really important after uh, Christopher was injured. Dana recognized that the caregiving component and the life uh, for caregivers needs to be addressed as well as those of us living with our injuries. So uh, thank you all for joining me. And thank you for your patience and grace today as we have this really important discussion. I want to set the table really quick before we dig in in terms of gun violence. As I said, I was paralyzed 17 years ago. And as a result, I've traveled around the country working at that intersection of disability and gun violence. So um, more than 300 people are shot every day in the United States. We don't hear about all of those shootings. We hear about the ones that rise up in the news. Um, about a third of the people who are shot every day die, and two thirds, uh, more than uh, 120 people every day, live with the result of their injuries. And, um, you know, we are four of those stories that get told every single day. But while any American can be impacted by gun violence, Black Americans are disproportionately impacted. Uh, they experience 10 times the amount of gun homicides, 15 times um, the amount of gun assaults, and three times fatal police shootings. And let's just say this now, 
police violence is gun violence. And we will talk about that briefly. We're grateful that you're willing to be here and share your personal stories, uh, not only about how you survived your own uh, traumatic injury and traumatic experience, but you know how you're moving forward at this point in time. We need to talk about the resources and the stigma and uh, hopefully offer some of the folks that are listening. We hope there are a lot of folks listening out there with us today. Um, help them understand how they can find resources, especially in areas that are um, uh, really under-resourced. So let's go ahead and uh, really dig in now. So um, let's start with uh, let's start with Felicia because Felicia, you you've had uh, some interesting stories to tell. For us, being in the midst of our injuries, we didn't get to see them through that lens of the people around us. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you think your uh, husband's care was impacted by the fact he was now paralyzed by gun violence? Was there stigma attached to that in your mind? Yes, absolutely. I, <laughs> I was actually just talking to someone about this um, yesterday and this uh, morning. So whenever I say that my husband was shot, I kind of feel like I always have to add on, he was in our front yard, letting our dog out. You know, he wasn't in anywhere crazy. We live basically on a cul-de-sac on the nice side of town, supposedly. Um, and I just feel like there are definitely assumptions, especially I've noticed as well, whenever I'm talking to someone without him, and then he just kind of rolls up and then they see him because then they also see that he's a white male. And I don't think they were expecting that <laughs> a lot of times too. Um, so there is a stigma. People definitely chain, like they're, they like kind of look like, oh, when I say, oh, he was shot. And then when I say, you know, he was just trying to see a license plate and try to, to report to the police, then people are like, oh, then they get sympathetic, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's often the first question I get with when people learn that um, paralyzed as a result of gun violence, what were you doing? What were you doing? Wesley, how do you answer that question? What, uh, do you, is that a question you get? No, <laughs> they already know. Um, the stigma with Black men and uh, with, that are paralyzed or, you know, it's already that we were shot by, you know, gun violence. I've had that, you know, that uh, approach many times. Um, and I didn't know that it was a norm for people to see, uh, to only, you know, consider black men um, being gun violence victims or survivors, you know, that are in wheelchairs until one day someone asked me, um, they asked me what happened to me and then they answered it before I could answer. <laughs> and it was like, oh, you were you shot? And I'm thinking, I said, at that time I said, all right, let me switch it up. And I said, no, I wasn't shot. I was uh, in a car accident and they got real sympathetic and, um, you know, and their approach changed. At first it was, it was like something they expected. It was something that they um, just, you know, in their mind, it was, it was, for me, it was defeating, but it was an eye opener to understanding the approach I had got all along since I've been in my wheelchair. Um, it's just that people already assumed and expected that I was somebody that had been uh, a victim of gun violence. And that was more or less my fate, like that. It wasn't no sympathy behind it. When that person said, oh, were well, you shot? It was no sympathy. But when I said, um, no, I was in a car accident. Um, they really got sympathetic. And, um, and I, again, I switched it again and said, well, you know what, I was shot, but you shouldn't just consider that being the only way that you see people like me. And, you know, of course, now they felt bad and apologized. But yeah, um, I think about that all the time. I'm never asked what happened to me. A lot of people already assume that what has happened to me was had to be something due to gun violence. And how about you, Tyra? Do you think that uh, being victimized by gun violence impacted you like in your rehab facility and those sort of things? 
Actually, um, my story is different. I think it's different when it comes to the African American community to a man and a woman. Um, mm -hmm. A man, they're automatically going to assume, oh, he's been shot, or he was out there in the streets or in the gang or doing something crazy. But as for me, as an African American woman, um, it was more so, were you born that way? What disease do you have? Or were you in the car wreck? Um, those are the ones that I get majority of the time. And then when I tell them, oh, I was shot. Um, and then that's when, you know, people are like really sad and like want to hear my story and things like that. It was never an assumption that um, I was shot. Um, and that and that's you know that's the hard thing that our males have in our community that i can honestly say about wesley that people are are going to assume that the male is the one to get shot and not the woman so yeah i never experienced that in my rehab facility people kind of already knew you know what was going on that i was a gunshot victim um so so yeah so it really didn't i really didn't get any negativity about it Thank you. Let's shift to the resources. Talk about some of the resources that were available to you in the early days of your injury. Uh, did you, oh, Wesley's smiling like he's got a story to go with this. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to let you start. Tell me what that looked like, Wesley. Oh, man. It didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't know I could drive till three years later. Let me start off with that. Um, no one told me that I could drive. I was really debilitated by the lack of resources that was provided to me um, from the hospital all the way up to rehab. Now I had a pretty decent, uh, I was in a pretty decent rehabilitation center. Um, it wasn't until around four or five years after I started my own organization that I realized that there were even hospitals for people with spinal cord injuries. And that was because I started to be approached by people from different communities, not my own. And when they would come into the, my office, they would say, oh, well, I went here. You know, we raised money for me to go there, you know? And I'm like, and so I, I've met people that had maybe a more serious condition and it, they were able to um, progress um, in a better, you know, more beneficial way due to the resources that they were provided at an early stage. Instead, for me, I went back to, thinking I was going to go back to a normal lifestyle because no one told me how to live in my position. No one gave me that representation of someone that actually thrived from my position. It was more or less like, well, he's paralyzed. I'm going to put him through this. And then it was swept under the rug. I didn't have any resources. I didn't know about anything um, for a very long time. And I'm a single father. Um, and at that time I was a single father. My daughter was two. And a lot of people understood that and knew that. And still at that point, there was never something to tell me how to be an independent single father raising this little girl with my, with my um, disability. And it just kind of, and that's the reason why I smile because if I didn't I mean, I even faced a pressure ulcer and health complications a year later, which led to two years of bed rest, 21 hours a day. And again, there was no resources to tell me how to get out of it. Everyone accepted that fate for me and they accepted me being debilitated. If I did not take control of my own life, if I didn't say, I got this little girl to raise, so I gotta go to school and educate myself on a healthier lifestyle, I wouldn't be who I am today. I would still be defeated by the circumstances and a lack of resources. No one ever shared with me a pamphlet that said, this is where you can go, this is what you can do. It was a lot of word of mouth. My mom was my hugest advocate. So she would get out and tell people what happened to me. And there would randomly be someone that says, oh man, do you know about this place that he can go to get supplies, this place he can go to get this. And so that's, again, that's the reason why I smiled is because yeah, without me really being able to take control of my own life and my own self, I would have never knew what was out there. And I would have never been able to connect with people that now I get to provide those resources to them at an early stage. I think that the driving part was the most debilitating for me 
because I just did not, you know, no one told me. So I, I get a lot of friends that always tell me now, like, Wes, you're always driving, I always see you in a car. I'm like, because you don't understand how free I felt the moment that I knew I could do it. And so it was like, you know, I went to rehab centers and everything and they would never, I mean, I did a driving course at a rehabilitation center that I was just going every day. And until someone else told me they had the classes, they was never presenting it to me. And so even though I utilized them for their, that resource, I still have my own resent, like, man, if I did not ask you about the things that you could help me be more independent, you would have never provided it. And I would honestly say it was just because of the color of my skin. Wow. That's, that's a tough statement. And one I think we need to sit with for a minute. Um, uh, and with that, I wanna say, this is the first, of an ongoing conversation. This is chapter one of an ongoing conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, like you, I'm, I access services through the Reeve Foundation, but uh, their commitment to continue this conversation is one that I hope we'll all uh, take advantage of and help them develop additional resources. So you didn't no one told you about peer mentoring? No one told you about adjustment to disability classes or anything like that? No, actually, <laughs> that might be the first time I've heard adjustment to disability classes for right now. So honestly, uh -huh. no, never told. I didn't know about peer mentoring until, again, once I started my own organization to create and be that representation and that resource that I didn't have. Then I started to reach, I started to find people that were affiliated with the Reed Foundation, affiliated with other organizations and institutions. And that's when I started to see that there was a lot of things out there for me. But again, I, my journey was me taking control of it myself and really no assistance and no help. I actually ended up having resent to the help that I started to get throughout the beginning of my journey because it didn't feel it wasn't, it wasn't authentic. It wasn't organic. It was more like, oh, like my two years of bed rest until I asked that doctor for a second opinion, I, I would have probably still been on bed rest to this day to be transparent. When I asked for a second opinion, we had a surgery two weeks later, five years now, I have not had that same issue. And so those things are real when it comes to the medical field. It's real when it comes to the institutions, when it, and rehabilitation. If you're a person of color, you might not get the resources that let you be more independent and live your life freely. It's more like, oh, I'm a, I felt defeated and, and defined by my circumstances just because of the color of my skin. And, it, it, and you know, to this day, I still get reached out by people of color and they're going through the same things. Um, no resources looking at me to figure out how they can just live their life. Some people don't even get wheelchairs for you know, a year time um, just because of insurance and don't know of the resources that are out there. So yeah, I mean, it was just, it was never someone that provided something that made me, that would have helped me be independent. If I got a resource, it was a resource that helped me be more debilitated. Wow. Wow. I want to get Tyra in here because she had some reactions to what you're saying. And, and I think all the folks watching this, and we're all going to share it out even more. I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that we're sharing uh, that the Reeve Foundation offers great resources, the Paralysis Resource Guide and the Paralysis Resource Center, as well as hooking you up with a peer mentor. Uh, and their growing peer mentor network across the nation. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Tyra, um, uh, I said adjustment to uh, disability classes and you kind of... Yes, I never heard of that. And before my uh, injury, um, I was in a medical field and mm -hmm. I actually worked on a rehab unit um, at a hospital and I never heard of that a day in my life. I was fortunate enough to have Wesley um, there to help me and guide me um, through where I needed to go to, even though it took me a year to reach out because, you know, the whole pride thing, like Wesley said, I can do it myself, you know, I can do it myself, but sometimes you just, you just need that help. Um, 
and he's been a great source for help and he's he's been a great advocate for help he's definitely and I think things worked out different for me too because I do know Wesley um and Wesley um he speaks his mind when things aren't going right for the people um in our community and um yeah and they really don't want him to you know bring um to speak that um so so yeah, so Wesley has been a tremendous help for me. But yeah, I without Wesley, I probably wouldn't have known half of the things that I knew. I knew things about the medical part because yet yeah, I was in the medical field, but like things about, you know, getting wheelchairs and grant for wheelchairs and just different things I can do. I didn't know any of that. Like mm -hmm. I'm sitting here now, like, you know, that's just amazing that I never heard of that before. Um, especially since I've been in the medical field for almost a decade. Um, but yeah, it's so crazy. And see, that's the power of peer mentoring, reaching out to someone who's already been there and done that and having that person, you know, the first thing that my peer mentor did is we went out for coffee. Uh, and so one of my first trips out in public, I went out with another wheelchair user uh, who helped me adjust to being seen in this new way and then helped me understand, you know, how to deal with high counters and heavy doors and and um, also started me on my own mission of advocating for myself of being willing to speak up and do that important self advocacy. So you two form that relationship naturally. And uh, are you are you uh, peer mentors now? Do you do peer mentoring? Are you in a formal peer mentor program? Do you mentor other folks? Um, not in a formal one. Um, I do it basically on the side. I uh, basically like other females who've been gunshot victims. Um, I mentor them, but not anything formal. I just, you know, especially at the people at the rehab that I was in was like, hey, Tyra, can you speak to this person? They have a similar story to yours. Can you just help them? And those are the things that I do because people don't get into the nitty gritty after you leave. The UTI, you know, the, the insecurities you have about being in the wheelchair, the insecurities you have about, you know, being in a relationship with somebody and, and while you're in a wheelchair, just the things that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis, like, the insecurity is going back to work because I go back, I'm back to work now. Like Wesley said, insurance purposes um, depends on what insurance you have is depending on what you can get and how fast you get it. Um, so I have a really good insurance. So that's why I decided to go back to work. And um, people, yeah, I'm starting off. They don't tell you those things, those little bitty things that, that you need to know to help you succeed in life. Um, because it is, you know, traumatic, and we're not even going to talk about the PTSD that you have afterwards, uh, and just dealing with that, just wanting to leave your house on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, just to feel safe. Right. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Uh, Felicia, your experience is uh, yet again different. Tell us about the resources that were available to you and your husband in the early days. And you are part of the Reeve Foundation uh, mentoring program. Is that right? Um, actually, I just got my own personal mentor and spoke with her on Monday. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then actually when I requested one while they were talking to me about everything that had happened, they asked me if I wanted to become one. So I will probably be a caretaker mentor here soon. <laughs> I got to go through the training and everything. But, um, but yeah, when everything first started with my husband, uh, it was a whirlwind. We stayed here locally for about two weeks. Had no idea what to do. Um, luckily, his uncle lives in Atlanta. And he knew all about um, the rehab center. And so that's how he pushed, uh, he works in, in insurance. I'm not exactly sure what he does, but he knows people. <laughs> and I think a lot of spinal cord injury is about who you know. Um, and so he knew who to call at my husband's job to get the pre-authorization to get to Shepherd up in Atlanta. Uh, and then once we were there, it, everything opened up even more. 
it, if you know the right people, it definitely can help you get to the resources that you need. I don't think I put, like if I had been in that situation, I wouldn't have been able to go there, if that makes sense. Um, he also had good insurance, has good insurance through his job. So he was able to go to that center for as long as he needed. Then he was in the Air Force, so private previously. So then he went to the VA and that opened even more doors for him. So we actually were very fortunate in just knowing knowing who to talk to, where to talk to them, when to talk to them. Because you also network at some of these rehab hospitals too while you're recovering. So he would hear from someone else, well, I did this to get a car, you know, or a van, or I did this. So it's something that you don't think about, but it's a lot of who you know, um, just like I guess most of life. <laughs> but we actually had pretty good access to resources and I'm very, very happy. And I, I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't because when everything first happened, they throw all this information at you and you're just trying to figure out if you're gonna live or if he's gonna live. And you, you have to hear it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And you also, when we talked ahead of this, you talk about something that I think many folks know, especially women, especially women of color. When you're out in public with your husband, they automatically assume what about the two of you? They automatically assume I'm his caretaker, which, yeah, I, I am in a way. But my, uh, to him especially, my primary function in his life is his then his girlfriend, fiance, now wife. So it was basically, I was looked at as, oh, are you just kind of the help, you know, and can we talk about these things in front of her? And I was just kind of looked at with suspicion a little bit, like, why are you here? Can you go somewhere else? Which is kind of rude. One good thing I have to say about my husband, well, I have a lot of good things to say about my husband, but um, he will immediately say, this is my wife. Whatever you have to say to me, you say to her. So I... I know that he will always say, stand up for me in that respect. And he's been awesome. He's not going to just let someone treat me like I'm just someone there to help him get along in his life. He looks at me as his partner and he makes sure everybody else does. That's awesome. Look at that. We're all very proud of him. We're all <laughs> very proud of him. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to throw this out to everybody. Tell me what resources you really still need. What, what would be helpful to you, especially in this time of COVID? Uh, and if you don't mind really quick, you know, I relied on a, a caregiver a couple hours a day just to come in. I live alone just to come in and help me a little bit every day. Uh, and with COVID, I, um, I lost that resource. And now I'm fully cleaning my own home, fully doing all of my own shopping, you know, managing all my own laundry, these kind of things that I had someone helping me with. And boy, do I miss it. Um, you know, it takes an hour to make the, I mean, to change the sheets on the bed, right? Um, so um, what resources do you think you still need? What, what would be helpful to you at this point? You know, and do I, you know where to get them? I want to answer this just on a different, like, on a different level, because I feel like, you know, with me and my organization, I try to make sure that I can tie into all the resources that are provided. We focus on a lot of fitness and nutrition programming. So of course I try to get more people to be active and healthy so that they can take more control and be independent. Um, but, you know, from a spectrum of like, when we look at people with disabilities, especially when I look at people from different communities, I see so much of the privilege that is provided when it comes to even home ownership, um, when it comes to the insurance base, when it comes to um, the natural resources of therapy and, you know, this ability of going to hospitals. So like for me, you know, after I, we hear from everyone, I would just like to know what are those resources when, because of course I'm still renting my home. Right. Like, and I don't mind that I'm still I'm in the process. I have more knowledge of how to do ownership on my own. But then I also run into people that 
you know, a year after the injury, two years after the injury, now and again, a home built that's accessible. Um, a lot of people know me from Queer Eye and they got a chance to witness the house that I was living in before they remodeled and made it accessible for me. And, you know, that house was a lot of, I dealt with a lot of adversity every time I went home from even using a wooden spoon to turning a knob on the back of my stove. And so, um, and that was for years. I've been in this house for years. And, but I had accepted that. And so I've, I've witnessed people, you know, coming from my community that don't even have uh, ramp access, you know, don't even have those type of things. So they're staying at their home all day long because of that lack of resources. So I just wanted to throw that out because of course, like I said, now in my journey, I do have knowledge. I do, my mom comes over, she works with like a, a, a company that can kind of assist and, and do some cleaning for me still. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And I still use that resource as well. But, you know, of course, the peer mentorship is something that I would love to hear more about. I know Reed's Foundation does it. I know a lot of friends um, that actually are mentors or looking to be mentors with the Reed Foundation. But even with the, um, I think whatever you said first, it was about adjusting to the disability or that resource would be something that I think everyone would like to hear about, you know, that's on this call, that's watching. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out because, again, there is a privilege when you aren't a person of color. There is a privilege when it comes into all these different sectors of, you know, trying to find equity outside of just having your disability. You know, I have to go into the world and understand that I'm black and disabled every day. You know, and that's something that's a reality for me. So rather, I'm trying to get some assistance for my disability, but now I'm judged by biases because of this color of my skin. But I also understand, too, is that if I had the direct resources, then maybe those would be ways that I could open up doors for other people compared to doors being closed because of people's point of views on how they see me. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to respond to that really quick before we move on. Uh, I hear you. Uh, adjustment to disability, um, uh, I think that actually came from my Center for Independent Living, uh, an opportunity to be with other folks with disabilities and just talk about what it meant to live with a disability. Um, I didn't have what they can now call trauma-informed therapy at the time of my injury. Uh, that wasn't something that was available. And uh, like you, you know, I, I, I struggled. I was a homeowner before my injury and being a homeowner gives you certain advantages. I had that equity, but the house that I live in now, when I had to move, I ended up, you know, showering in an easy up tent on my back patio with the garden hose for two years. Um, uh, because I couldn't access the bathroom in my house, which meant that, you know, toileting involved a bucket. Right. Um, so, but while all that is said, you know, my struggles were still different because folks look at me differently. Folks were maybe more willing to help me. So I think, you know, everyone who's listening that goes, oh yeah, I struggled too. Um, those struggles are magnified more when there are additional stigmas and, and biases put on you. And, you know, you weren't given access to the same level of information. And that's what I think we're all here to try and work to fix. Uh, and so let's talk about how we can bring those resources. What is it, an organization with the power of the Reef Foundation, with the, you know, with the weight of that name and, and the work that they're doing, what can they bring in to your community to be helpful? I think what Wesley said is about mainly is about the home ownership. I am mm -hmm totally there with him because you, once you actually are in this world you will see there's not things that are made for you so you have to make those things mm -hmm. um whether you know now there's homes out there that there's four hundred thousand dollars homes where you just got injured where your finances aren't there to purchase a four hundred thousand dollars home so you need to build one um so that definitely needs to be something that needs to be addressed for the African-American community is about how to own a own how to own a home while you're disabled as well as that first year 
where you're disabled, your injury happened, your your finances, because um, like I'm one of them. Like I wasn't able to work. So everything that I was able to pay for was a struggle to pay for. Um, I lost my car once I had to get it back. Um, thank goodness that I had, you know, family members that help uh, me pay for things. Um, and then my aunt now, like she helps control my finances because of, I am back to work, but I don't work full time and I don't make as much as I used to. So I have to literally live off of the little stuff that I, that I have now. So just a financial education about, you know, what to do, you know, when you're not working um, as well as I don't get social security disability um, because of there, there's the pride thing. <laughs> but that goes back to, you know, when I had a daughter in high school, I didn't want to receive government assistance and things like that. But home ownership is a big thing because when I first got into the wheelchair, I had stayed at my dad's house. My dad stayed on the second floor uh, apartment. So every time I had to leave the house, my brothers would have to come and carry me up and down the stairs. And that was, you know, that was straining on them because they had lives. You know, I had a busy life. I had therapy. I had to go back and forth too. And then, you know, I tried to be independent as possible. Like I would go to the grocery store and still, you know, do things like that. So like now, like I can't, I can't fit into my restroom. So I know exactly what you guys are talking about. So I will have to rent a hotel to go and to take a shower whenever, you know, once a week or so like that. And that is enough money as as it is in itself um so just things to be more accessible for us especially that we something that we use every single day which is the place where we lay our head needs to be more accessible for us to get to and for us to afford right i hear you uh felicia does your husband come in the room yeah <laughs> hear me <laughs> i was like yeah yeah, he just came home from an appointment. Um, but I actually, when they were talking, it made me think of something. When I first got to his rehab hospital, um, I left work, traveled up to Atlanta. And uh, the first thing I thought was like, okay, I'll be here for like a day, get him sort settled in, and then I have to go back to work. They immediately told me I needed to stay there for a week. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, on Monday, you have an appointment with our social security specialist. And I think every organization, hospital rehab center should have someone in that job to talk to a person that's been newly injured, paralyzed, because the first thing they did was say, it's going to be six months before he can get disability. And yeah. so I had, to, and, I, and I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't know any of this and these aren't even my finances we had just gotten married right before we came up there and um basically the only reason that when he was out of work for those six months that we were able to get money to keep paying for things was because they had me fill that out the first week he was there because you have to wait at least I think at least six months before it goes into effect yeah for uh for all that sort of stuff. So I agree exactly with everything that they've said because it's a huge expense. Because especially considering it's not just like a lot of people, like people assume that my husband was in a car accident. It's not just, oh, your spine, spinal cord got injured. There are surgeries because of the gunshot, any side effects to that. Like he was, he couldn't eat for over almost a year. Um, he's, this is my husband. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> um, he couldn't eat for over a year. So there was repairing his esophagus. Trachea got hit. Um, like, uh, Tyra said, your UTIs, you'd never think about that. There's so much that goes into it that if you don't get that education immediately, you're being set for failure. Right. Well, I think that um, 
there are places where financial literacy is taught to children, right? How you're going to save for your future, how to budget, how to save for a mortgage, these kind of things. But I think the layers of disability on that, and I think too that some of the issues that we've talked about, stigma around being Black, also impacts the ability to get access to that knowledge and that information. And uh, I do know that. Um, for example, Tyra, while you were talking, I'm like, okay, well, you know, the Reed Foundation can't do one-to-one uh, -one grants. They can't, the Reed Foundation can't give you money specifically because of the way the laws are written. But Centers for Independent Living have community uh, development block grants that can go in and do some of the things that we're talking about, ramps and bathrooms and this kind of thing. And Wesley's like, oh, girl, wait, I've got a story for you. But um, <laughs> I think that we don't get that information. And I think that, again, those assumptions about who one is as an individual also plays into who gets the application for the uh, uh, block grant and who isn't even told they exist. So um, it looks to me as though developing some more um, information around financial literacy about how to access services and resources is also really crucial here. But um, you know, I, go for I, it. I do want to hit on that real quick. I think yeah. that a good way to put it, you know, and I, I know that the Reed Foundation is trying to do better. That's why we're having these conversations and doing more to create a better impact. But being knowledgeable, just because someone cares for our community, seeing what part of that community they're actually doing the care for, because according to grant processes, sometimes you're if you within the language, it could just say that you're serving people with spinal cord injury, you're serving other disabilities, so they get those grants. But within that system, they're judging who they want to provide the service to. And I think that that's where the issue is. A lot of organizations that receive funding from places like the Reed Foundation aren't connecting to the inner city communities. I don't like to say underserved because I feel like we just, biases is the reason why we're not being served, you know, mm -hmm. and, and because if you can knock on the front door and provide that somewhere else, why can't you go into these communities and do it? And so as we're sharing this information of not being able to pr be provided with resources, that's just because it's not that these facilities aren't getting the grant funding that is available. It's just that their reach and their impact isn't with people of color. It isn't with those, you know, those demographics that actually really need it. It's providing it to people that have the privilege and ability to represent them in a in a way that they want that social norm to look. And of course, we talk about representation. A lot of organizations lack the representation of people of color. So when you look at the social norm, would you want a person of color providing all this information to them where that now you have to represent them when that's not being the norm coming from pamphlets, coming from, you know, uh, videos, like anything that we've ever gotten has not had a representation of us. And so when it comes from that, it's just, again, maybe the process too, as understanding is that when you're providing those things to these communities and these organizations, make sure you see what is their, what is their, their rate on or percentage on people of color that they actually serve. What are they actually doing for them? How do they tally that up? Because that is an issue when there are organizations receiving money and still hold their own biases on who they give that to and who they give that service to. Because we wouldn't have this conversation if these, these organizations and institutions were opening up to all communities, right? And so I think that that, that is an issue, but also the financial literacy part having the ability to teach people how to understand what is going to happen, but even entrepreneurship, right? We know that there's a lot of institutions when it comes to accessibility that really won't even allow us to get in the front door. So trying to think that we're just going to be able to do something when it comes to work or jobs or anything. I have issues as an entrepreneur going to, you know, meetings and things where there's no accessibility. So how do we empower these communities to create their own their own identity, but their own reality, you know, and don't have to go with the stigmas of always needing the help, but how do we provide those resources where they can control their own life? 
because I think that is where we get to as well. If we're constantly going back to resources that hold biases, that leaves us defeated at a certain area. That leaves us at a point where we're always guessing on how we can be independent for ourselves. And I think that's the main goal. It's not that we don't need the help. We will ask for help for the help that we need. But that doesn't mean that my whole life has to be shaped around help because someone then provide the resource that would allow me to be more independent. And I think that that should be shared even more on a broader spectrum so that we can yeah, so it can impact community. So my point is, if you're not if you're not reaching out to the black community, then maybe you don't get no money. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just <laughs> that's just how I go. <laughs> because hey, we're all human, and we all deserve equal chance. You know, um, yeah, I totally agree with you. There. <laughs> yeah, Felicia, anything you want to add? Um, that does bring up a good point because I recently, over well, the past uh, few months, started volunteering with you guys uh, or the Root Foundation um, as a um, ambassador for the Paralysis Resource Center. And part of what I'm supposed to do is to go out into the community. Well, before COVID, right now I do a lot of Zoom calls and I'm still learning how to do those. <laughs> um, but, um, and, you know, I didn't even think, like, I have like a, like a list of places and it didn't even occur to me to be like, have I reached out to like, there's um, my, my um, college here, my local college is historically black college for any of their students that might need these resources. And so I'm so happy that you both said that because it's gonna help me to reach out and get the word out about the services out there. Um, another thing I think that we uh, need to focus on in the, um, the African American community too is making sure that we're getting mental health um, paid attention to as well. Because actually our, our biggest advocates have actually been our case managers mm -hmm. and social workers, um, therapists. I don't know how, but they have information on everything. So, yeah, they do. so yeah. like, they're like, oh, he's having trouble getting a vehicle to get back to work. Call this number. Mm. And, you know, or he needs, or if he needed to get to a work, you know, a job, they were like, you can call this number. Like, if we have a question, even like when it, like reproduction, socialization, I mean, anything, talk to, just talk to a therapist, social worker, case manager, someone in that arena. And there's such a stigma about mental health in society to start with, but especially among the African-American community. I think it would be a really good idea to make sure that everyone knows that's available as well. I, yeah. I, speak to ahead, my I definitely speak to my therapist um, twice a week. Um, I definitely wouldn't have been able to be as far as I am now without her and without God, um, because not only do I talk to my therapist, I talk to God. Um, too and I just sit there and I take time to meditate because mental health it's a the easy part is getting shot okay <laughs> that's the easy part the hard part is the recovery road in the mental part of it because now your whole life has changed um, everything is different and you know and almost every day you're in pain that people don't see that you know people don't see your pain on the inside they can only see that you know that you're in a wheelchair they don't see when the weather's changing oh you're having spasms oh your back is hurting like we're gonna have rain I can tell we're having rain here in Kansas City coming up because I'm in so much pain like they don't see that part and that's a mental part like you have to be strong mentally to handle this because not a lot of people are, they can be depressed and in the bed and for years, and, you know, it takes a lot to get out there in the world and just to be yourself in the new norm, if that makes sense. It does, it does. So unfortunately, we're gonna stick with this conversation, but many of the folks who are watching this as part of the summit are going to see a wrap here in the next minute. And the Reeve Foundation has committed to allowing us to um, uh, continue this conversation. And it's going to become bonus footage somewhere. So I imagine at this moment, 
popping up on screens is some information to learn more about this conversation. Uh, I wanna leave one resource here before we continue our conversation so that they can wrap up the one hour package that they need for the summit. So uh, for those of you who are listening or are unfamiliar with where to find additional resources from the Reed Foundation, whether that's grants for your nonprofit organization, access to peer mentoring, to become a peer mentor, to learn about therapies and programs available to you through the Paralysis Resource Center, you can find more information at paralysis.org. Now, there are a lot of ways to get to the Reed Foundation, and that's one of the easiest URLs for me to remember, so paralysis.org. Uh, and for those of us who have to leave us now, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. So, um, the one thing that I want to ask all of you is, and we can stick together for about another five, 10 minutes, right? Yep. Can we finish? Yep. Are we all good? Because I think this is this is the crux of what the Reef Foundation wants us to get at. And again, I want to point out, I am not the Reef Foundation. I am a Reef ambassador like Felicia. I'm a Reef peer mentor, and I'm a person who um, you know has taken advantage of these services. So, but they are listening to us. Um, how do we, the the four of us, the five of us, uh, reach into the community, the folks who are being ignored, forgotten, who are being rendered invisible, how do we help pull them onto the stage with us and be seen and to receive the services? What can we do? What can we ask an organization like the Reeve Foundation to do to reach into our communities? Anybody? Oh, well, you know, I was going to let everybody else take time, but no, it's already on the top of my head, like, because I'm always thinking about, of course, I have a lot of talks, many talks of allyship and things like that, but I think just being able to just see everybody as human, right? Like, I think that the, the, the social construct of how people see those with disabilities and then also those that are gunshot survivors, um, is different you know and i think that the 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 reach needs to be broadened it shouldn't just be again like i said earlier it shouldn't just be where that the resources are like i had a meeting with someone with the re foundation one of my great friends now kelly and you know she brought the pamphlet right and she brought the pamphlet with all the resources in it and so my organization uses that to provide you know, to other people that come to us, you know, and so I think that just having the ability to make sure that, you know, you are finding more um, organizations that are representing those people of color, I think that in backing those organizations, it's, it's already, it's already a different stigma when people of color and all these different communities um, don't want the help or don't feel like the help is authentic because it hasn't been there right so i think like making sure that you are supporting those that are um able to go into those communities with their authentic true selves you know and making sure that they can get those resources there you know all of us are movers and shakers in different communities and like felicia just said you know this gives her the ability to even be more aware of the college that she went to and other institutions right so i think that like even this conversation has helped but i really believe that in order to reach certain people you need to back the people that are willing to go into those communities in an empathetic way and come and, and with a, a approach of integrity because as we've learned in these conversations that has not been there you know, a lot of things hasn't been led with empathy and integrity. You know, you're either judged for what happened to you or you're judged for the color of your skin. And I think that, you know, when we look at people of, of gunshot with gunshot victims, right, the survivors of it, well, that has its own stigma itself. And so, you know, there has to be a way that even people like us, you know, are even back behind and seeing more of what we can do to support the Reeves Foundation to get out into the world. We talked about therapy, right? Therapy sounds a lot better to me than peer, peer mentoring, 
just on a sense like it should be tag team right like I want the person to show me how to live but I also need somebody to talk to me about how do I how do I accept the things that I have to deal with every day due to my injury, due to the things that I have to face within this world? Because it takes one person to, when that person, you know, looked at me and said, oh man, did you get shot? That's that's somebody else with a mindset that's not developed like mine yet. And if they heard that, you do not know the triggers and what would happen to them that could put them in a more debilitated state because of that. And so thinking of, yeah, you can teach someone to be independent, but if the world keeps looking at you and judging you for what happened to you, you know, then it's hard. So having that access and ability for therapy, I think would be very essential. And just, again, I don't see it as being something that they pay for, but seeing what therapists are in certain communities, seeing like, how can that be a bridge of a gap, even the peer mentors, how can they reach out to their community and find people that are in that type of work that they can provide to those that they speak to, you know, so just sometimes just adding something extra on the form, right? Making sure that someone can go and say, oh, do you know a therapist in your area that will help with someone in this position can be something that can be, you know, applicable to these communities as well. And I, I totally agree with you, Wesley. I also believe too that when, um, they need somebody, basically the saying is, you can't tell me how to do something unless you've been in my shoes. Um, and I know that sounds crazy, but in the African-American community, that's kind of the mindset that that we have um, or that, that, Af that, that, you know, our race has. And for us to be relatable, um, to the people that we want to serve, we need to have somebody like them, like me or Wesley, go into those communities and relate to them and talk to them and like, hey, you know, uh, what? Well, I grew up in poverty, just like you. Hey, I went to the inner city school, just like you. Hey, but these are how I defeated these odds and these are how you can too. Um, I think that is also a good thing um, to have, especially when you're going into an African-American community. I think that um, I think the Reeve Foundation's strength is their ability to take a core of knowledge and then give it to smaller organizations, organizations like your own, Leslie, um, to allow them to do this one on work, authentic work uh, within um, uh, the community where one lives. Uh, rather than have someone come in and tell us how to do it, to have someone who's part of our community do that. So I think, again, that's where um, Reeve Quality of Life grants come in. Uh, Reeve gives grants, er, awards grants uh, twice a year to nonprofit organizations. Uh, and they're doing them in three areas right now, direct impact, quality of life, and now uh, doing some work with COVID. And those processes, uh, you know, it's not just that you fill out an application and send it in. They're reviewed by external reviewers, folks like us who live in these communities who have some understanding about what it takes to run a program and how to, um, and, you know, does this sound like a grant? You grade them on a scale. There's a, a rubric, right, that you, you go through and you read and, and does this, does this, uh, does this description fit this goal? And, and do they have uh, the resources to measure uh, their success and these sorts of things? So you don't just do it in a, you know, uh, you don't do it in a vacuum. But I think that um, what I'm hearing, and I know the Reed Foundation is listening too, is that we need to make sure that our external grant reviewers, folks like us, are uh, more representative of the communities. Wesley, have you ever applied for a quality of life grant from the Reef Foundation yet for your organization? We did last year. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. successful, but I'm like, well, I'm learning, I'm learning. Yeah, so. and that's it, you know, uh, we've got to learn how to fill the forms out. We've got, yeah, so. Um, oh, it is, it is um, Kansas City, so we have tornado sirens on on Wednesday so I'm gonna keep hitting mute because it's loud. oh that's right yeah <laughs> so we don't do that here in Arizona is it 10 o'clock 
What time is it? One o'clock? Yeah. When I lived in the Midwest, it was 10 o'clock on the second Wednesday of the month. They did all the tornado sirens. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the Midwest, folks. Yes. Uh, yeah. Felicia, tell me, tell me your thoughts on how we can make sure that we're authentically reaching the people we need to be reaching. Uh, I do think that the Reef Foundation does have some good programs. I am part like an ambassador for the Paralysis Resource Center. So what I, for my little personal uh, experience, am able to do is I'm going to be able to take what I know out there. And since I, like I said, I was just so myopic about these are the problems that people with paralysis in general facing, just thinking about what we're going through. It didn't occur to me to say, well, what, what hospitals or what rehabilitation centers or even like what local um, groups can I talk to so mm -hmm. that I can get this information out there? And it, it is going to take a little bit of some of the grassroots, unfortunately. <laughs> it's not going to be able, I mean, the Reef Foundation does a great job getting that information, but they have to have people in the communities out there who are able to go into places to actually reach people. And so it's definitely this conversation just today with Wesley saying everything is just making me reevaluate which places I want to focus on. I mean, I want everyone to have access, but I also want to make sure people out there who look like me, because I don't see many of them. I live in a city that has a very large African-American community, um, Savannah, and uh, rarely see any, wheel any people, men, women in wheelchairs, much less African-American people in wheelchairs. Uh, the most I think I ever saw was when I went to like a convention <laughs> and yeah, most of those were a bunch of white guys, women kind of rolling around. <laughs> so I want to make sure that everyone has accessibility because look at the makeup of the city and who you see out there who are able to get to events and have norm normal lives again. Because that's really what everyone wants is to have some sense of normalcy. It's a new normal but it's a way to get around. And so I think definitely maybe reaching out to more um, diverse groups in the community to say, hey, we have this program. If anyone wants to volunteer or even kind of like give like a little incentive, like you said, hey, you wanna apply for this grant, go ahead and apply for this grant. Do you have any people that would want to help get the word out in the community. So, cause like you said, you see people like Leslie and Tyra both said this, you see people that look like you that are going through this. And if they're saying, look, I got this grant, you can get it too. Or look, I was able to get a vehicle or a home because of the, um, the little paper, the packet that the Reeves Foundation sends out that tells you all the different resources in your area to look for help. That's another person that knows. Excellent. You know, there, there's a lot more that I want to talk about. We did this the last time we talked. We started a great conversation and we had to end it because everyone here has very busy lives and are, are going to need to get on with it. So um, the thing that I know in the years that I've been dealing with the Reef Foundation and that, that it's an organization that is, um, always willing to be open to self-examination and growth and continues to evolve. And as we said at the top, when we started this conversation today, this is a beginning. This is the start of the conversation. This isn't the last time we're going to talk. It better not be the last time the four of us talk. Um, but uh, this is the start of a conversation. And I know there are folks in the Paralysis Resource Center and in the development where they do the grants uh area listening there are folks all the way through the foundation the organization listening to the conversation that's being had here today and so i want to leave each of you with an opportunity um to take just a minute or so each um and let's talk about where do where do we go from here what what is it what 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 should be the next step in this conversation is there somebody that wants to start with that? I think I think just the next step is having more 
conversations like this. I am a firm believer that one is not done. Um, and because of the things that we constantly are seeing in mainstream media, um, you know, these things are still happening. There's, there just needs to be, I don't like to use the term uncomfortable conversations because I've been uncomfortable just my whole life. And I've never had to break that down into a, anything in a term. I think that we should just have more dialogues about these serious, these serious issues um, to raise more awareness, get more people to be able to reflect on themselves and see what type of work they're doing to make this world a better place. Um, I think that that is just the way um, we need to reshape the social construct when people see uh, those with disabilities and gunshot survivors, um, you know, that we just need to reshape it and we need to have more dialogue. I don't know. I'm big on social media. So like I was looking at all of us and I was like, man, a campaign of just all of us, me, uh, you, Jennifer, uh, Felicia's husband, Tyra, and just say, I'm a gunshot survivor. And it's all these different color of people, right? It will show something different, you know, when you think about what that means. It doesn't, you know, how do we just push it out to be, make more awareness of it so that people don't have to think and assume that, you know, it's just one demographic of people that this is going to be uh, cause to. And so then maybe that opens up, oh, well, if I gave this person the resource, I should have made sure I gave it to that person as well, despite how their situation might have transpired. So I think just because, of course, like for me, I love to see more people that's outside of my community that's faced the same things that I face, because then we can have a, a conversation and we learn from each other. And so I think that that's another way that we just build community. I think that there's not a big enough community for those that are gunshot, you know, survivors and or how, you know, I don't think that that community is is large enough or built large enough. So if we can be, you know, somehow representing that on the forefront because of the different demographics, the different ethnic groups. I think that that too is a powerful statement. You know, it makes people want to now listen more, have, you know, tie into those dialogues because they're going to wonder, like you said, Jennifer, they're like, oh, what did you do, right? Like, no, just, I need you to know what happened to me. You know what I mean? Like, it's not about what I did or what I didn't do. It's just about what happens to people like me, as well as like other people that don't look like me. We're all in the same boat, you know, and I think that when we can do that, then those resources can be spread a lot wider instead of being spread so thin. So that would be mine. Thanks, Wesley. Felicia, Tyra? Um, I think just more of to piggyback off of Wesley said, what Wesley said was just, you know, more conversations like this and then taking those conversations and showing action. Um, action is the big key because we can talk all day and all night, but if nothing is being shown from that, then the conversations are just conversations. Um, so I believe conversations and action and then just like more unity like Wesley said like all of us getting together because you know I don't see you different from me you know um my like I tell my kids it's not black and white it's chocolate and vanilla um so <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're all in this together and um race should not be a factor because bullet doesn't have eyes and bullets don't care if you're black, white, orange, brown, if you have one leg or two, it, it doesn't care. Like bullets are gonna land wherever they so land. You may be the intended target and you may not be. So I think that should be um, the main focus. Thanks, Tyra. How about you, Felicia? Like Wesley and Tyra both said, the conversations need to be had because otherwise you won't know what needs to change. Also is equally important, like Tyra said, you have to either be able to bring about that change or spark the desire in someone else to help you get that done. So I do think the conversations need to keep happening and we need to be able to come up with a solid plan or several plans to get the word out, make things actually accessible, 
um, to everyone, all aspects. Well, my friends, that sounds like a great place for us to leave this today. Um, I wanna thank each of you for your patience and your grace, your energy and your fearlessness in having this conversation with me. We're gonna start wrapping it up. So, uh, you know, the Reeves Summit, the 2021 Summit has ended up being virtual because of COVID, but um, events like this are where folks like us come together and share our commonality and the uniqueness of our experiences, whether it's geographic, racial, gender, um, whatever other um, definers there may be that impact how we move through the world. Uh, and so I'll look forward to when we can gather again uh, to have conversations and out of that comes sparks of new innovation and new creativity. So for folks who are watching, uh, if you're looking for a peer mentor, if you're looking for resources uh, to navigate this world of paralysis, visit paralysis.org, uh, which is the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And also if your nonprofit organization uh, works with people living with paralysis, Take a look at the um, uh, quality of life, direct impact, and currently COVID relief grants that are available. They're available on a grant cycle, uh, but uh, it's all there at paralysis.org. So Felicia Gibson, Tyra Randall, and Wesley Hamilton, thank you so much for joining me today. Additional information is going to be posted with this on resources and how to contact each of us if folks choose to. And uh, I'm really grateful to all of you for joining me. I'm Jennifer Longden in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, uh, thanks to the Reef Foundation for hosting this conversation. I know they're listening and I know I'm not gonna say goodbye. I'm just gonna say until next time because this will be continued. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. Hi everyone. And thank you for joining us for a great panel discussion. We are now going to turn it over to, for a live Q and A with our panelists. Today we have Felicia Gibson, Tyra Randall, and Garrison Red here with us to answer some questions from the audience. Um, we're going to jump right into the first question now from Jacob. Um, feel free, Felicia, Tyra, or Garrison to jump in with any answers you may have. And the question is, how can we build visibility and solidarity within our two communities, African American and spinal cord injury? Um, this is Tyra Randall. I think the best way we can do that is by uh, education, educate, educate the African American community um, on what it's like to work with the spinal cord injury because most of the time they don't get the education that they need. Um, honestly, I think disability should be even taught in schools um, just because uh, people living with disabilities are such a big part of the world, and especially somebody with a spinal cord injury. Um, so education is the best thing that I can I agree with um, Tyra. I also think that just getting out there and not staying at home, being out with your friends, being visible, I think is a huge thing because until I, started until my husband got injured, I didn't know anyone in the community. And now I know a lot of people and I would have never known them if I hadn't been in those situations. Um, so I think it's a combination of getting out there, meeting people, um, talking to your friends about it. You know, with Facebook posts even, we share things that are going on with um, the spinal cord injury community on our just our regular Facebook pages and then our friends start asking us questions. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that as well. Um, I think visibility is very, very important. Um, the reason being is because a lot of times when I, when I originally got injured, it was like before social media. So I didn't know of any other person that ever had a spinal cord injury. Um, you know, growing up, going to schools, I, I never realized how much of an ableist society that we lived in. And 
all the way to public, especially in the public school system, it's not really accessible um, for children or an adolescent. So one of the main things is, you know, I like to tell people we got to create an inclusive environment. So we just got to keep on advocating each and every day. And especially individuals that have the injury, you know, we have to be visible so that way people can know that we exist. Great, thank you. And Garrison, while um, we have you on the spotlight, we would love to hear a brief little introduction about oh. you and how you came to be connected to the Reed Foundation. Okay, definitely. Um, I'm Garrison Rad. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm the founder of the Garrison Red Project, which is a not-for-profit organization that helps individuals with disabilities achieve independence, as well as I'm a Team USA Power Powerlifter. Um, currently, I'm the number one in the country in 130 pounds, and the sport and the movement that we complete is just the bench press. Um, with that said, I'm also an advocate, a motivational speaker, an author of the children's book Bobby Goes Bobby's Adventure at a New School. Um, where I highlight in the book the need for inclusion, diversity, and accessibility within the school system. So I'm like a jack of all trades. And then a couple of years ago, I started um, moderating with the Reef Foundation when they started the Reef Connect, where that was a that's a, that is a platform where it brings individuals with spinal cord injuries together. Um, I think that's one of the most important things. Is like I said, was visibility. And just you know, us communicating with one another because I, I believe in my case specifically, um, I remember being in a hospital and you know connecting with the Reed Foundation, but other than that, I really didn't have you know much connections to other individuals with spinal cord injuries. And I think now with you know social media, it's actually growing the community and making us more visible because now people are seeing that we got ton, we do tons of incredible different things, um, each and every one of us. So yeah, that's a little bit about myself and to answer how I got connected with the Reef Foundation. Awesome, thank you, Garrison. Um, our next question for anybody is, we received a question about a participant from a mother whose son is really struggling. Do any of you have any advice for him? Well, I would say that he should, he has to focus on himself as far as tr figuring out what he wants to do in life or now that he does have this injury. Um, so once he figures out what he wants to do, he'll start to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's how he would basically overcome everything, in my opinion. Uh, to piggyback off of that, I also think it's best for him to just get out there, you know, get out there with his friends, like go out to eat with his friends, just still do the things that he used to do um, to make him feel like, you know, that, you know, life has changed, but I'm still able to be me. Um, and just, just get out there and just own it. You're gonna to have to own it because I know that first initial, like my whole life has changed, you know, you get your insecurities about a lot of things. But once you just step outside that comfort zone, you step outside that box, you'll see like it's a whole new world out there for you and your life is really just beginning. Thank you. Our next question is about re-entering the workforce. Do any of you have any advice on re-entering the workforce? Ooh, I can do that one. I just, I just started back work um, six months after my injury. Um, so that was pretty recent and pretty soon. Um, I went from being a nurse to a unit secretary um, at a hospital, a local hospital here in Kansas City. Um, and my job was very accommodating for me. Um, now I'm working with uh, our CEO of the hospital and the vice president, um, trying to make the hospital a little bit more accessible, wheelchair accessible, instead of the bare minimum that you need for the state, um, because that's really not, you know, much. 
um, you'll, you'll figure out things aren't for you, but it's the people around you. Like, don't be afraid to ask, help, ask for help or take things like you need, like your grabber or, or things like that with you to work. Um, you and then make sure if you're like working long hours like I do make sure you always like you know reposition yourself so you won't get ulcers and you know go to the edge of your your chair and just practice on your balance and your core um and just just try and do um most of the stuff you can by yourself you know just try and be as independent as possible um it may not be easy but it will you will learn to adjust as you go along I can just say from watching my husband go back to work, um, he really leaned on his HR people um, to make sure that his concerns were met, that if he had any concerns, like if he had any troubles, they constantly checked in on him or he would have to talk to them, talk to his leadership. Um, and he just basically just had to swallow any fears he had and remember that he could do it. Thank you. Um, you addressed this a bit in the session, and we would also love to hear from Garrison, but do you have any advice for healthcare professionals providing psychosocial support in helping the newly injured? Well, in my opinion, um, you do need that support. Um, the reason being is because it's a tough injury. Your whole lifestyle changes. and um, it really affects people in, in different ways mentally. So, you know, by having someone there that you can express yourself to um, and, you know, they don't hold any like judgment, that's very important as far as helping you grow. Um, and then, you know, everybody do have different ways of coping. And, you know, that's just one coping mechanism I found for me socializing with others like that are, you know, considered strangers, um, that helped me a lot. So like if I was at like a gym or a park, you know, socializing outdoors, um, that gives me a way of expressing myself. So that works for me. But yeah, to definitely have a someone there that you can speak with is always an amazing and it's good to you know, air whatever you need out and things of that nature. We apologize again for these te uh, technology issues today. Um, the recording of this whole, um, the summit session and this Q&A will be going on the Free Foundation YouTube channel. And we're very grateful that each of you participated in this really important topic. And the Reed Foundation is already working on reaching out to different communities. And we wondered if there's anything else that you weren't able to share um, during this Q&A or during the, uh, the video that you would love to share now. Um, I guess one thing I guess I could say that I didn't get to say during the um, creation um, when you're just talking about the whole mental health aspect, um, I think it's just really important to know that it's not a bad thing to reach out. Um, as far as professionals know, I think that they should definitely have that training, especially if you're dealing with someone who's a victim of gun violence or any type of violence to have that, that um, tra trauma experience. Um, and realize it's more than just the sum of a spinal cord injury. It's also dealing with the trauma of having been shot or however, if it was any sort of traumatic experience. Um, so you kind of have to have someone that specials and specializes in maybe not only spinal cord injuries, but possibly trauma as well. Um, and also that uh, Wesley and Tyra inspired me after the last uh, talk that we all had, I got in touch with my old alma mater, which is a historically black college, spoke with their disability services 
um, coordinator and was able to get her into in touch with the Reed Foundation um, so that she can try to get more information to pass along to the students with um, spinal cord injuries, mobility issues, as well as possibly looking into trying to get some grants to help improve the school. So I want to thank Tyra and Wesley um, for bringing that point up and um, still reaching out to other areas in my community to try and help and open a conversation. Well, thank you for taking action. Thank you. I love to see that. Um, I think um, the question kind of skipped out on me. Uh, so it's technical, di technical difficulties on my end too. <laughs> so what was the question again? I'm sorry. Um, so we were just wondering if there was anything else that you would love to touch on that wasn't mentioned previously from the summit session or during this Q&A. Um, I think the I, I after the uh, the uh, the live um, recording that we did, well, the summit we did uh, that I looked more into like the peer more mentorship thing. And I became a peer mentor. I think that is one of the best things that you can do besides having a therapist that can actually help you get through something because not only is it somebody who has experienced what you've experienced, they can give you insight onto how to handle it better um, and how to just move on and just get through it um, better because they've done it. Um, so I think that was a good take from that is the peer mentoring thing. Um, I'm sorry, my nephew is here. You hear him in the background. Um, but yeah, I think that that is the best thing possible, I think, to do um, and just for people to just educate themselves about the rights that they have as a disabled person. Um, because some people, they just go with the flow. They don't think, you know, much into it. Like, hey, but you should know your rights and know what, um, what something should uh, be done for you. In your case, like if you're in like an apartment complex, like what walls do they have to buy for? It, when you're at work, when you go back to work, you need to understand what the law has for you and say what they need to do for you with the law. So just educate yourself about what the law says so you can help advocate for yourself if you need to speak about it. Thank you. So I currently do not see any additional questions and we really appreciate all of your patience as we tried something new. We want to make sure that everyone had a chance to see this conversation and not just the summit participants. Please know that we will stay connected to all of you and we look forward to continuing discussing this issue. Thank you so much, Felicia, Garrison, and Tyra for your time today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.